Hey guys, Kirai Kino here. Moving right along from the last episode, next up is the very loose sequel to Frankenstein Conquers the World, War of the Gargantuas. This film is interesting to me for a few reasons. I think the influence of UPA as co-producers is probably felt the most here. Uh, Saperstein famously told Toho to get right to the action in Invasion of Astro Monsters so as not to lose the uh, American TV audience, and they seem to have done the same thing here. After the opening credits, we immediately see a ship attacked by a giant octopus, which is killed by Gyra, who then turns his attention to the ship. From that point, the film becomes unusually hyper-focused on the monsters. Virtually every scene has to do with the monster plot, directly, without the sort of character-driven subplots you would see in something like Frankenstein or Invasion of Astro Monster. The longest detour is probably when they let Kip Hamilton sing an entire song before getting attacked by Gyra. It's an unusually one-track-minded film, right up to the abrupt ending where an undersea volcano suddenly erupts and kills both Sanda and Gyra. Most of the film is spent with Paul Stewart and company trying to understand the monsters and clear Sanda's name, but ultimately it doesn't really matter. The fight sprawls out into the sea and they're both taken out by an act of God. It's also interesting to see the same basic role played by Nick Adams in Frankenstein fulfilled by Russ Tamblin, despite Kumi Mizuno still playing the character's assistant. Nick Adams approached his roles very earnestly and is said to have gotten on famously with the rest of the cast and crew, including a rumored affair with Mizuno. Tamblin has said in retrospect that he was in the midst of what he called a pretentious artsy period at the time he made Gargantuas, and he clearly considered the whole thing a bit silly. He looks either bored or faintly amused in most of his scenes, takes advantage of the language barrier on set to ad-lib much of his dialogue, and apparently didn't actually see the film until decades later. I have to wonder what the production was like for Kumi Mizuno, playing functionally the same character she had in Frankenstein, but with Adam's place taken by someone that even Saperstein described as a prima donna pain in the ass. After that, we've got two Daimajin sequels released within a year of the first one. Both the second and third films have been called Return of Daimajin, which actually led me to put them in the wrong order initially on the letterbox list, not really realizing my mistake since all three of them came out in 1966. The first sequel is called Return of Daimajin on the Blu-ray and Wrath of Daimajin on Letterboxd, the latter being closer to the Japanese title. It's a different setup from the first film, and I guess technically a different Majin, but it plays out in a pretty similar way. There are two peaceful clans living on opposite sides of a lake, both worshipping a god whose statue sits on an island between them. A neighboring clan wants the more fertile land these two clans occupy, and attacks both of them, setting the stage for the statue to come alive and intervene at the end. This film has an interesting twist to it in that the statue is actually destroyed partway through, but the Majin intervenes here and there in various ways until finally reconstituting the statue as its body for the finale. It feels generally like kind of a retread of the first film. There's even a lesser imitation of that cross shot that I liked. But all in all, it's done pretty well, and it's just different enough to justify itself. Overall, it's pretty good. Daimajin Strikes Back, which is the more literal title appearing on the Blu-ray, is more of a departure and honestly not as good as the previous two. This one has the statue placed up on a mountain as a local warlord captures loggers from a nearby village for slave labor, prompting four young boys from the village to make the dangerous journey across the mountain to rescue their fathers. They pray to the statue along the way, and the Majin appears in the last act to save the boys and defeat the villain. At this point, the formula wears a little thin, and although the child actors are a good deal better than some of the kids that would appear in the Gamera series down the road, the focus on them doesn't really do too much for the drama. It also doesn't have quite the visual flair that the first two had, which is a shame. Daimajin Strikes Back isn't a bad film all in all, it's just unremarkable. Next up though, we've got Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster, which really shook things up for the Godzilla series. This one is always fun, but it really benefits from being viewed as part of a binge. After Ishiro Honda directed nearly all of Toho's tokusatsu and kaiju productions for over a decade, the approach that Jun Fukuda brings to this film feels incredibly fresh. 
The story involves a band of castaways discovering a mysterious organization secretly building nuclear weapons on a South Pacific island guarded by a monster. An adventure story in a secluded location that draws more on the early James Bond films than previous kaiju films. This is complemented by the score composed by Masaru Sato, who drew on contemporary Western influences to create a lively soundtrack that contrasts sharply with Akira Ifukube's scores, which were more informed by European classical music and Ainu folk music. Sea Monster also seems more aware of and interested in youth culture than its predecessors. The score not only evokes the jazz and rock fusion of the James Bond theme with several electric guitar passages, but it also provides the diegetic music for a dance marathon where three of the core ensemble meet. The castaways consist of those three young men and Akira Takarada, playing against type in a more anti-establishment role as a bank robber. Their adventure on the island consists of rebelling against a militaristic organization exploiting slave labor from nearby Infant Island. Kumi Mizuno, who played an almost noirish femme fatale in the previous Godzilla film, appears as an Infant Islander in a floral outfit, which almost seems like a nod to the Hawaiian influences in the surf culture of the time. The Peanuts are replaced as the Shobijin by a seemingly lesser-known duo called Pear Bambi, who sport more of a Bridget Bardot-style look in this film. These elements all add up to produce a Godzilla film that feels a lot more hip than its predecessors, even today with all these elements unmistakably tied to cultural currents from like 50 years ago, there's an energy to it that's just undeniably fun. This movie slaps. Wrapping up this episode, we have Gamera vs. Gyaos. According to director Noriaki Yuasa, Kids proved to have little patience for the weighty adult drama of Gamera vs. Barogon, so this time a prominent child character was reintroduced into the formula. The result is an interesting intermediate step between the straightforward, rather serious Gamera vs. Barogon and the unabashedly child-focused Gamera vs. Virus, which lands it in a roughly similar place to the original Gamera. The story is better and more focused this time around. There's a conflict between a somewhat poor small town in the mountains and the builders of a new expressway, with the locals holding out for a better price for their land. In the middle of all this, Gauss appears nearby, prompting talks of rerouting the highway altogether as the local farming economy is devastated by the monster's appearance. Whereas the original film's Toshio was only vaguely connected to the other leads, Eiichi, a kid from the small town, encounters Gauss up close and is consulted by the military as they formulate a plan to stop it, creating a bridge between the local conflict and the official response to the unfolding crisis. All in all, the result is pretty good. Eiichi seems younger than Toshio, and he is a little bit annoying, but he's frankly more sympathetic just by virtue of coming off as less insane. The film delivers on the monster action with a generally faster pace than the previous films, and Gauss is an interesting and memorable opponent for Gamera. I can see why it went on to have the distinction of being revived for all the future incarnations of the franchise. Evidently, the child-focused approach worked pretty well too, considering that the future Gamera films would lean into it really hard. Before we see how that turned out, though, it'll take the whole next episode to get through the rest of 1967 alone. We've got The X from Outer Space, Gappa, King Kong Escapes, Yongari, and Son of Godzilla representing the peak of the kaiju boom. Until then, thanks for watching, special thanks to my patrons, and extra special thanks to Exploder Button, John Pinier, and Ryan Clark. If you want to support my videos and other projects, my Patreon is linked in the description, along with the rest of my social media. I'll see you next time.